Hey, my name is Andrew Kaplan, and you're in the middle of listening to a seven-part mini-series going behind the scenes with the Nevada Growth Team. We explored all kinds of things that typically don't get shared publicly in the growth community. We talked about how they think about growth, how they set their strategy, their operating system, what they track, what they don't track, how often they share internally to drive alignment. And we talked about some of their biggest challenges, their fears, and their speed bumps along the way. Let's jump back in where we left off. Welcome. We're here. Took us a little bit of the morning to get all set up, but we're situated. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. This is a fun experience. This is my first in-person podcast, yeah. Uh, mine too. So learning experience for all of us. My first podcast ever, so. <laughs> this is it? Your first one ever? Yeah, first time as a guest, yeah. Dude, that's dope. Well, I'm glad that I could be a part of it and that we're doing it in person. Yeah. So the biggest question that I have is y'all are from New York. You just took the train all the way here today. It's pouring, raining. You got up early this morning. Why in the world did y'all agree to do this? I think a few reasons. One, it was just a cool idea. It was different because I had done a lot of podcasts, but it's there's so much you want to say, but also you really want to be short and concise and not go too into it. So you feel like you're just giving kind of these like tidbitty LinkedIn answers, which are great for some ways, but you feel like you're almost saying what you want the audience to hear actually going into your day-to-day process, what you do. So I just like the idea of like diving deep and really giving someone a full view when they ask me what it's like to work at Nevada, what it's like to work in growth, like how we set up our growth plan. I could stand on this and be like, no, this is actually everything. Yeah, that's cool. Was there like a process to getting here? Like, did y'all need approvals? Did you have to ask your CEO? Did you have to pre-run the question by him? What did you need to get a yes to get here? No, we didn't. We probably should have double checked some (laughs) of the questions with our CEO. I think we do this enough. I do enough podcasts at this point. I ran the idea by him, but He trusts that like we know what is okay to say, maybe what we unfortunately can't give away all of our secrets. Sorry, everyone. Also, I think it just goes to show the brand you build in our relationship. Like anytime you ask us something, they were like, yeah, that sounds cool. Vandry's doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I shared kind of off recording, I feel like the really good stuff happens in informal conversations. I feel like it's when you go to a conference or you meet somebody who's a peer or has a similar title at a different company. And then you say, hey, could I take you out to coffee? Could we grab a beer? Could we pop out at lunch at the conference? And usually there's like an evolution where at first you're talking and sort of as equals. And then at some point, somebody breaks the ice and says like, okay, but I got this thing going on. Have you ever had that thing? How do y'all approach this? I'm dealing with this thing. I think I should do this, but I'm having trouble doing that at this company. And so I wanted to create a show where I could go a little bit deeper with folks like y'all. That's why I'm also really excited about this because I'm newer to growth. This is the exact type of content that I would have loved to be able to binge and like understanding how people set up their process and the challenges they face and just like navigating all that. I think that would have been incredible starting off and I'm still so new. And so this is exactly what I think I would have loved to have starting off too. Hell yeah. And is there any part of the two of you that are scared to share the wrong thing? Right, because I'm going to ask questions both on some of the tactical or strategic things, but also how you feel about it and what you struggle with and maybe some of the things that you haven't shared before. Is there any hesitations that you're going to maybe share something that you wish you didn't? I think when we were prepping, one thing I found myself doing was I really wanted to share the right answer. Like when you asked about like, how do we set strategy? I wanted to have a really laid out plan that we always follow and everyone's aligned and it works beautifully. Yeah. And then we were talking about it and it's like, hey, we try to hit that maybe 70, 80%. But let's be honest, we work in a startup, like things happen. At first, yes. I was like, oh my God, people are going to realize that we're not perfect. And then I kind of clicked like, that's the point. So you're going to hear us talk a lot about today. Like, hey, here's the, in theory, what we're aiming for. Here's the actuality. And the actual is more beneficial to a lot of people listening than the theory. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's actually how I started my business was... I met with a lot of people who had like read all the articles. Most of them had taken Reforge. I love Reforge. I'm actually going to be involved as a guest lecturer. So like a lot of admiration there. But it was mostly people that had taken Reforge. They felt like their brains exploded academically. And then they were trying to figure out in practice, how do I do some of this stuff at my company? I don't work at SurveyMonkey or Squarespace. I work at some little Series B company and I don't have these resources and I don't have access to all the things that I could do. What should I do? And so I think that that's dope that that's what y'all will share. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of pressure to share your successes and yeah. I feel like the exact right stuff to share is this. So I'm excited. So as we get going, let's start with some intros. 
I'm Natalie Marcatulio. I am head of growth at Nevada. Like I've kind of been in growth-ish for a while, just like quick summary. I promise I won't do the whole 10 minute intro. Yeah. But I actually started as a growth hacker, which I always think is so funny because I remember saying this on the podcast we did together a while ago. Like, I feel like now it's kind of like growth people don't like that term. So I really did start in the days when like, you know, you're trying to rank for every single little keyword and using all the SEO, not like black app, but like very technical things, make your things go older or better. And now looking back, I feel like growth is so much more strategic, cross-functional. That's a lot of what I do now. So it's just funny. I've, I think I've gone and seen everything from like the really hacky days of growth to now it being such a strategic part of the company. And how long have you been with Nevatic? For about two and a half years now, and then been in SaaS startups for about six or seven years. Yeah. I'm Raman, and I am newer to growth, but I have a great person to learn from at Nevatic. I actually started my career when I graduated school in investment banking, so totally different, but I think got a lot of that more like analytical foundation. Really, I think quickly realized when I was in banking that I didn't want to be behind a spreadsheet all day and like that was in the right place for me and ended up pivoting and joining a Series C startup as a product manager. I did that for a little bit and I was a growth PM, so doing a little bit of stuff like top of funnel, but also a little bit of SEO, working really closely with design, engineering, like typical product work. And then I'm now at Nevatic. And I think in this growth role, like kind of tapping into that analytical investment banking side and then a little bit of that product side. And that's part of what I love about this job now is like it feels like a blend of everything. And yeah, it's been a great four months at Nevatic, but yeah, it's been awesome. You know, what's interesting is you say, hey, I don't come, I'm new to growth. I don't come from a growth background. But I have spoken with a lot of folks who work in growth at different levels, and there's actually a common thread of folks who have management consulting or iBanking or investment banking or whatever it is backgrounds. And so I think that you learn the process to finding the right answer and using data to problem solve at scale and probably for some of the biggest, baddest companies ever. So even though you don't come from growth, I think you'll find yourself pretty comfortable as you get going. Yeah, I feel like it is just that problem solving, and that's part of what I love about it. I heard this definition of it. It's like, it's finding problems in a system and like aligning to solve towards them. That process is what's exciting about it. And I feel like you don't get to do that in a lot of roles. And because it is so generic, and I think you get to tap into a bunch of different skill sets. That's part of what I, I love about it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to explore all that stuff. Let's take a little bit of a step back. Let's talk context for the company. And then we can talk about how growth fits in and kind of what y'all are working on as we get going. All right. So let's talk where Nevatic is at. So the point of this episode is to really take a step back and talk about kind of the state of the business, where it's at, how y'all got here, so that folks who are listening to this, one, can understand what the business does, who you serve, but also to understand what's the scale of the business. So we'll get into both of those things. Maybe we can start with the story, like what is Nevatic? What does it do? And how did the business get started? Maybe you can take us through that, Natalie. Yeah, I can take that. So it's kind of a fun story. I feel like everyone says their origin is a fun story, but our two founders were solution engineers at Oracle. And so they were building a bunch of demos like manually. Solution engineers, generally their job is to help sales team like with the more technical side building demos. And so they were doing that and kind of just had that moment of like, there's gotta be a better way. So they started it together kind of as like a side project while they're at Oracle and basically said that, can we automate the building of these demos? And it was funny because in a weird way, COVID kind of helped us because our founders could work on it. Maybe also work at Oracle, we didn't have to give up everything at once. And so, Classic move. Yep. But, you know, kind of just a little side project. And they did that for a few months and then got into YC, which was a pretty cool story because they originally got rejected from YC, Y Combinator, which is like Accelerator. And the leaders of YC said, okay, if you can get 10 YC companies as customers, you guys can get into YC. And then they just kind of like hustled and got 10 customers. This was before my time, but I heard, obviously I've heard the origin story. What year YC? It might have been winter of 2020, I believe. I'm asking because I worked at Postscript, which was in YC 2019. So I was curious if it was the same class, but it sounds like no. I think it was 2020. I really should know, or 2021. I should know that, but. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> well, yeah, I need a fact checker at the end of this. <laughs> But they basically during YC kind of realized that this doesn't just have to be for solution engineers, which was pretty cool. They actually realized like some PLG companies and kind of what you guys all did 
would want to put an interactive demo on their website so people could experience the product beforehand because they always came up from the solution engineering background. And that's kind of when they realized like, oh, there's more uses for these interactive demos. And since then we've expanded and really now our bread and butter is putting something on your website so people can try the product before they sign up. Yep. And in terms of go-to-market model, can you talk us through how Nevadic makes money? Like what is the model? I know you sell to PLG companies. You're sort of like a hybrid PLG company yourself. Take us through. Yeah, I always say that like we're kind of faux PLG because that's how our customers describe using interactive demos, but really we are sales led. So right now there isn't like a self-serve option to sign up from the website. We do have a sales process, but obviously we have a bunch of interactive demos on our website. So we often find that first sales call is beyond that initial discovery isn't just kind of like, what does your product do? We can kind of dive deep and sometimes we'll even build out the first demo on them on that call. So it is sales led, but kind of like what I feel like I'm seeing a lot of like hybrid motions right now. And we're trying to use our own product to kind of become more hybrid. Cool. And I meant to ask this before the last question. So I went out of order in my own head, but can you take us through the stage of the company? So like, where are y'all at in terms of like fundraising and company you know, employee size and maybe revenue a little bit? I just want to contextualize a little bit more before we go too deep. Yeah. So one thing I've really loved about working at Nevadic, and they've been very like intentional from the beginning is they wanted sustainable growth. So I don't have a flashy series to throw at you, but basically we did a seed round. And then after that, they said, let's see if we can do this without needing to raise. We'll see maybe. But really the goal is like, let's have sustainable, profitable growth and try to grow slowly and surely versus let's hire a hundred people at a time. And then unfortunately, as we've seen a lot of layoffs happening and we're seeing a lot of companies do this now, but when we initially had this idea, like a bunch of people told us we were doing it wrong. By and not then, doing a big raise? Exactly. Not like growing super fast and not, you know, growth at all cost. And now it's very funny because people are like, oh my God, that was so smart of you. And so it's funny just to see in like two years how the table have turned from like, you're never going to make it if you don't raise a huge series B, you hire a hundred people to now people are really respecting that. And like a lot of companies are, I feel like are copying that model. Yeah, for sure. And how many people work at Nevadic? Yeah, so we're 22 people now. So still, again, slowly and surely growing. For the first like two years, it was just me. And then now luckily I have ramen with me. So we're a two-person growth team. Hell yeah. And I feel like it's cool that I, I love that y'all only raised a seed round because I feel like over the last probably three years, I feel like there's been a big movement away from the traditional VC model. And I, I come from Wistia, which also was that. So Wistia never really raised a big round and did a big VC round. And I've also worked at HubSpot, which was the opposite of that, which raised a massive round. And I think it feels different. And I'm sure that there's plenty of folks who will listen to this that come from bootstrapped or companies you know, that didn't raise huge rounds. And so I think it's nice to have a model that there's more than one way to do it. And you can still have a growth team and you can still have big ambitions. It just doesn't have to be VC backed. And I bet that feels in a different way. Yeah, I always say there are definitely pros and cons. Like, look, are there some days where I was like, it'd be really nice to have VC backed money and a team of 10 people? Sure. But overall, what I really like about this is I just feel like we get to choose a little bit of our own destiny. Like, we really get to do fun, creative things. We get to come to Boston on a Thursday to record yeah. a live podcast because I feel like we're not as scrutinized under the lens of our VCs. I've heard the pressure that other companies can be. Yeah. So, can we talk a little bit about your funnel? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to ask some questions, share what you're comfortable sharing. But let's talk through the funnel a little bit, kind of starting at the top. So in a given month, how many folks are on your website? We have about 10,000 visitors to our site every month. So 10,000 visitors to the site. And how many of those enter your funnel in whatever way you define entering your funnel? Yeah, we define it as MQLs. And it's a little different than what I hear a lot of other marketing teams. Like we don't have advanced MQL scoring. It's just people who book time with our sales team. So people who book a demo and it's about 100 a month. Cool. So 10,000 visitors to the site around 100 book time with the sales team, which is your MQL. And of those, how many do you expect to turn into customers? Yeah, about like 20 to 30. Cool. 10,000, 100, 20 to 30. How many total customers do you have? We literally the other day, I think it was like a few days ago, hit 700. Oh, dang. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. So 700 total customers. And what is the total revenue for the business, annual revenue? Yeah, I can do ballpark for this one, about like 5 mil to 10 mil. Oh, perfect. Congrats. Thanks. Yeah. It's an exciting time. It's definitely like this is the furthest I've worked at a startup stage. So this is a fun point when you're past product market fit and have something figured out where you're like, how do we make it go from here to here? Right. We have product market fit. Now we're in scale mode a little yeah. bit, which is cool. And what is the hardest part about working in growth at a company at this stage? The early stages, 
everything's a win and you're just trying to find product market fit. Like that's the main goal. Like anything brings you closer to that goal. And now it feels like there are so many things we could do and there's not as obvious as a goal. Like the goals like scale up. Yep. But it feels like there's constantly like we'd be doing this experiment, improving here, here, here. So just like focus and prioritization and constantly questioning, am I doing the most important things? Am I on the right track? That keeps me up. Yeah, I understand. Well, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Sorry, did I, we're going to add? Oh, I was just going to say like the other thing is we have like 10,000 visitors to our site. So we have a good amount of data that we can start testing things, but we're not like Instagram where we can do a lot of like get stats sig in two hours. So I think that also makes it challenging too, where like we're constantly blending quantitative and qualitative and like having to kind of balance between being really data driven, but also using our gut to figure out what the next move looks like. Yeah. I've never met someone who works in growth that said we have enough data. Yeah. And so it's a constant dance, right? If you, if we could have done this conversation, you could have said we have a thousand people on the website this month and you could have shared that. You could have said we have a hundred thousand people on the website and you could have shared the same thing about data. And so I think that's one of the challenges of working with growth is what is enough? How do you have enough to make the right decision, but not have it take too long to validate it? So the mix makes a lot of sense to me. Hey, thanks so much for listening. That's going to be it for this mini episode. As a reminder, you are in the middle of listening to a seven-part mini-series going behind the scenes with the Nevada Growth Team. And I would love your feedback. I'd love to hear what you think so far. If the content is interesting, if you're learning, if it's resonating, let me know. You can either tag me on LinkedIn at Andrew Kaplan, or you can tag the show at Delivering Value Podcast, or leave me a comment. The two best places would be one, either on my Substack which is at media.deliveringvalue.co where all of the episodes will be published or on any of the individual episode pages on YouTube. And if you are enjoying the show, the best thank you would be a review. You know the game. Those reviews help the algorithm surface my show to other folks just like you. Thank you again for listening. On to the next episode.